Ryan Fenton here with Joanna Greshel and world champion Josh Kerr. His first question is, what, what is it like to hear that, that title along with the name now? It's, it's pretty unbelievable. I think, you know, the first race I did after Worlds was uh, the Diamond League. Um, I think it was Lausanne or, uh, or Zurich, sorry. And I was so excited. I was like, I'm going to get introduced as a world champion. This is going to be so fun. And uh, I think it was in Swiss German. And so I, I didn't even get to hear it properly. So I was like, well, that kind of sucks. But uh, no, it's, it, it's an amazing dream come true. And I think, you know, we're finally now at this point where um, I'm good enough to, you know, be called world champion. And I, I did it on the day. And now it's just like, how can we keep that ball rolling and, and you know, exciting stuff in the future? I want to maybe rewind a little bit to you coming to the U.S., kind of starting, I guess, for, for us here in the States, that, that journey where we got to learn who Josh Kerr was. Um, but what, you know, looking back over those years and starting with that journey to get over here, what's, what was that like and, uh, and, and getting that experience? Yeah, it was, it, it, it's kind of crazy looking back because, you know, when I was, um, when I was growing up in, in Edinburgh, I was, you know, I had uh, the likes of Chris O'Hare. He, he was in my training group and then he came, went out to the U.S. and I was like, wow. And he used to come back and tell us stories all about it. He's like, look, you get paid like a salary to go to college. And I was like, that's insane. Like, that's the, that's the coolest thing in the world. And, uh, and so from then, I just always dreamt about coming over to the U.S. And I was like, this is going to be the next step to be a professional so that I can um, try and try and be a world beater. And so, yeah, I was trying to get recruited at 16 years old, um, and it was just difficult because I left school at 17. And every college coach came back. They're like, look, you're a bit young. Just give it a year. Keep in touch, all this stuff. And, uh, and then, yeah, Joe Franklin was like, look, we want you. You win races, and uh, we can develop you. And I was like, amazing. That sounds great. I was like, I have no idea where New Mexico is. I've never really been to the U.S. And I was just like, yeah, let's do it. And so, yeah, it was just a, an interesting process to even get used to. Like, I turned up two weeks early by accident because I looked at the date wrong. Just silly stuff like that. Like, I wasn't allowed to sign my own release forms because I was 17. So I had to bring my parents with me, which was the least cool thing you've ever seen in the world coming into college. <laughs> And then it was just like, I'm here to do a job, and, um, and, and that's to, to get better at running and to, to raise a profile for myself to sign a professional contract. And, and that was the reason I was in college and the reason I left college early. So, um, yeah, and then I got to start my journey with Brooks back in 2018. Wow, so this, where you are now as world champion, is that something you've been envisioning since 16, 17? Yeah, I think I've always, um, I don't know if it's, it was naive or whatever, I always felt like I had the fundamentals of being good enough to be a world champion. I think um, throughout the whole years um, growing up and in college, I was like, I have a mentality and, and the characteristics of someone that I think is good enough on the big stage. Um, I'm good in big moments. Uh, and so it's just like, what can I, how can I find the right home to facilitate that? How can I find the right coach to facilitate that, the right brand? Uh, and, and be able to kind of put that together. So yeah, it's, it's always been part of the process. I think it's always been something that has driven me. I, I'd never felt like I was gonna leave the sport without being the best in the world at something. And um, now it's finally, you know, been and, and happened. You just get real greedy. I think it's like when your first paycheck comes in, you're like, okay, when's the next one coming in? And, uh, and so that's, I think that's what's really exciting right now in, in, in my life is, is we have, so much competition coming up. We have the Olympics and then, you know, I already have my buy into the World Championships in 2025 and, and you know, you can ask for a better time um, for, you know, being at the peak of your career. There's a couple of majors coming up. Is it, um, I mean, you obviously won in college, I think set a collegiate record in college, uh, but I feel like that uh, Tokyo Olympics getting bronze was probably your big yeah. coming out moment to the whole world. Um, how hard was it to follow that in 2022? Yeah, it was really hard. It was just hard after the Olympics. I didn't race anything after the Olympic Games. You know, my agent was phoning me every week before the Olympics, and he was like, what about this event, or this, or this? And I was like, Ray, never talk to me about after the Olympics, ever. I was like, this is why I'm in this sport. This moment, this date right here is the reason that I do this whole sport, so I will not be discussing any further racing afterwards. <laughs> and uh, that came with a bit of a cost, which was, you know, I did something that I was proud of, and like, having a physical medal is, is, is like something that not a lot of people can say that they've done. So it was like, I've climbed this big mountain and I've reached nearly the top, and then I've jumped back off and I've gone back down to the bottom for the start of 2022. 
And I looked back up that mountain, I was like, oh, it seems like a big climb. Uh, and that's kind of what the Olympic hangover is. And I think I had that pretty bad. And um, it just what like the world championship wasn't exciting me that next year. It was just I got myself in a bit of a rut, and uh, you know I feel like the 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 results I got in 2022 was deserving of like some of the things that I did throughout the year in terms of training and you know injuries and like focus and things like that. And and I think that 2022 world champs was the was the refocusing of like okay you're so like you're you're good enough to be top five in the world on an off year. Think about if you really just you know really honed in and, and um, what you think could be could be possible so yeah it was a it was a big defining year for me last year of just like you know even in your bad years you're still reasonably good so like let's pull this together a little bit and that's interesting just this year you raced I guess you had to schedule that ahead of time you knew you wanted to keep racing after the world championships was that because of that previous experience yeah I think what I like to do, have done in the last couple of years since the Olympics is like, I need to gain as much experience in these high level races as I can. Um, before, um, so say 2016 and, and previous, it was like, you know, the 1500 could be slow, it could be fast, it could be tactical, whatever. And so you had to have your real tactical brain on. And then from 2017 onwards until about 2021, it was like, this is just going to be a, a sprint from the get go. And so tactics aren't really now involved. And then in the last couple of years, what it's been is like, well, everyone can run really fast. So now it's almost tactical again. Uh, and so I just loved being in the experience of like running against the same guys I'll be running at in, in a world final or Olympic final. And, and I think those, that was the experience afterwards. It was like, okay, well, I can now, you know, I'm, I'm now excited post world championships. I'm now excited um, post Olympics to, to do all these other events where um, I have the medals now that I'm proud of. And now it's like, what other fun things can we do? The UK is obviously rich in history in, in athletics and especially the mid distances. So I'm, you know, you winning the medal in at the Olympics. I, I'm I, I'm guessing that was a big reception by the country. But then you talk about this hangover in 2022. You miss the medals. You're still relevant, right? You're still in the finals, but your countryman wins. Actually, goes on and wins, right? So I'm curious what that was like dealing with all that, that this Olympic hangover, and then really not, it wasn't like you could just hide because now Jake gets the attention, mm -hmm. right? What was that like? It was, it was such a mixture of emotions. I think on the day, um, like when it happened, when he won, I was just so proud of him. Like I've known him for a very long time, um, probably since I was nine or 10 years old. And so he's, uh, you know, he's a good couple of years older than me now. He's three or four <laughs> years older than me. And, uh, and so, so I was able to watch his career flourish. And, and he's obviously had such an amazing career. So watching him become world champion from behind was, was a really interesting experience where it's like, I'm so proud of my friend, but also we're in an individual sport and I really want that as well. And so it was really inspiring of like, you know, if you just do, if you, you know, tick all the boxes and you, you put the work in, uh, you find your moment and you really go for it. And, um, and I think, you know, there was definitely, a definitely part of that was like, you know, I had the Olympic medal, that probably annoyed him. He then wins Worlds, that annoyed me. And then I'll win, I won the Worlds this year, I'm sure he's incredibly not. <laughs> um, we chat still quite a lot right now, but um, and so now we have, you know, we're both kind of peak our careers going into next year, going after Olympic medals. So it's a great relationship. I, I, I love my time with Jake, and we actually were meant to be rooming together at the Olympics. They, we requested to change, but I, I think you probably would have seen some of the beds in the Olympic Village. They were like, <laughs> it was like this. We were this close. We're looking at each other like, is, is this serious? <laughs> Um, it was the same with World Championships. Like I was, I was, I was rooming with Neil. Um, they just like to throw us in together, just have a bit of fun, I guess. I, I was gonna say you, you're, you're annoyed with Jake. Jake's annoyed with you, and then there's Neil annoyed yeah, at both just, of you. Yes, he's <laughs> pissed. Um, but yeah, I think you know. I think w what we do really well is like in season during the races, we, we we're just out there to try and you know you know, rip chunks out of each other and just really go out and try and win races. And then I go back to the room after Worlds and there's a note there that says, um, I think I owe you a beer, fella. Give me a text um, from Neil. And, and that's, what, that's what we're about. Like, he was one of the first guys I, I saw afterwards, after the Worlds, and I was the first guy that went and saw after Worlds. It's like, you know, as soon as we cross that finish tape, like, we need to be there for, for those big moments. And, and, um, and it's, it's, it's just fun. Like, you know, British middle distance running is 
coming into an era that um, is massively exciting and uh, you know we're trying to hold British athletics up as much as we can and uh, you know get us through some financial struggles but yeah. you know I think uh, the, the performances are there so it's, it's pretty exciting. Yeah I, I, when I think of the, kind of that history like the Cram, Ovet, Sebco, right you guys are kind of the big three right now what does that feel like and do you, do you talk to the old guys and uh, about kind of the, the the torch you're carrying? Yeah, I think, you know, I, I've had some great conversations now with, with, with Steve Cram and, and um, I know Seb was, uh, you know, presenting medals and stuff when, at Worlds and obviously he was there and, and being able to chat to him and, you know, he invited me to his house but sadly wasn't Monaco, it was California so I was like, ah. <laughs> Um, let me know when it's Monaco, but uh, you know I think that's that's what it's about. Like, and it's our job as well now. Of like, you know, now these are our experiences. So let's turn back and and really bridge that gap between where we were when we were growing up and then uh, where we are now, and try and keep the success rolling on. What's it like to have a rival like Jakob? Um, I think he brings a lot of eyes onto the sport. He's kind of like the figure of um, you know 1500 meter running in terms of running fast and you know in all these diamond leagues and stuff like that. And so um, it's an interesting dynamic. I think everyone has a different dynamic with him. I, he highly dislikes me. I think so. Um, that's always, I, I, you know I enjoy it. I think you know within the UK we're all good friends off the track and then. Um, I think the 1500 is quite a friendly um, group of guys. I think we all know just how much hard work we have to do to put in to, to be there. But um, yeah, I, again, he brings eyes to the event and uh, I'm excited to, to you know, race him again this year. What do you do um, to work? Do you do any work on the mental side of the sport? Um, I think it's the thing that I work on the most. Um, you know, everyone, a lot of people like to talk about, you know, I put in X much more mileage or this much more hard work or, you know, I, I work scientifically for all this stuff. I think the mental side is something that I'm probably the best in the world at. Um, you know, I work with, with different psychologists and, if, you know, mindfulness coaches and, and like uh, just everything that I can to, to put myself in the, in the best position because it's, it's a very high pressure environment if, you know, for an Olympic final or for a world championship final when you're sitting in the, the call room and, and you know, you're there for an hour or so and you're just like sitting as close like this um, before going out and, and trying to define your career on three and a half minutes. It's, it's like it's, it's a lot of pressure but you know, I think I thrive in that. I've always kind of enjoyed that pressure side of it. And, uh, you know, I think it's something that you can't push too much. Like, you can do too much mileage, you can do too much, like, speed work, but you can't too much, do too much stuff for your mental health and, and to be ready to go when it's time. Yeah, it, it's super interesting just because, yeah, as you said, Jakob kind of is the face of men's 1500 running the last few years. But last year, you know, your countryman, Jake, was able to beat him. This year, it was really fun. Um, I mean, sometimes, sometimes it seems like the the field will almost defer to him in a way. I mean, sometimes that's just fitness or if that is a mental thing. So it was very cool just to watch you race worlds. Um, and you just obviously had a lot of self-belief like in that moment, even though there was this idea that he is the best in the world at this event and no way anyone's gonna beat him. Um, and yeah. you know, maybe you did have the benefit of seeing Jake do it last year. So it's like, okay, it is possible. How do you just rise to the occasion at the biggest moment of the year? Um, I think it's like a very like media driven thing where he's like seen as this unbeatable character. Like it's definitely something that, you know, if a fan watches or, you know, people are watching, like he doesn't lose a lot. Like I won one fifty on meters last year. He lost one fifty on meter last year. I'm the world champion and he's not. Like it's pretty obvious to think that like it's very difficult to beat someone like that. But, you know, I, I take my time rather seriously. Um, so me living in the US away from my family members, me living in Seattle away from my fiance, like that time is so valuable for me. And you know, just because someone's won a couple of races doesn't mean that's gonna get in the way of my, my journey. And I think that's the thing that I take the most seriously. It's like, if I'm really gonna do this, if I'm gonna be thousands of miles away from everyone that I love, I'm gonna do it for the right reasons. And when the time comes, like no one's gonna get in the way of me performing my best on the day and, and they're like from 2019 I ran a PB in the final at world champs 2021 I ran a final uh, of the Olympics I ran a PB 22 I ran a season's best and then a season's best last year like I'm going to give my best I'm going to be there for that day and um, and that's how I define like it being worth my time to do to, you know to have all the sacrifices that we have to have as athletes and um, that's yeah that's all part of it I guess it's just you know 
you're not going to get in the way of how much time and effort I've spent to, to get into this position. You, you, uh, one, one more question on this. You mentioned media-driven things. After that race, there was obviously a lot of talk about comments that he made about he was just the next guy, I was only 88%, whatever those, these things were. Were those, were those media headlines to create a story, or were those things that you heard that, that you felt somewhat disrespected? Um, I think like I think he just has fun in media, like interviews. Like I think I saw that he thinks he works thirty percent harder than everyone else, and then he feels eighty eight percent. Like if you do the math on that, he's still over hundred percent of what I should be. And so <laughs> like just fun things like that. He just throws things around, and um, it's something that I don't really take too much of a notice off because you know when the gun goes off, it's like there's there's nothing that you can say to me that's going to make any difference, and and. Uh, you know, I, I kind of zone in and, and, you know, I don't have social media during, I have actually a whole different phone during um, World Champs or Olympics or even Olympic trials time. So I'm not really involved in any, in any of the media stuff. But yeah, I think all it is is just we're, we're bringing eyes to the event. We're bringing eyes to, you know, the rivalries. Um, I think there's now some pretty big rivalries across the sport. And, you know, people will win and people will lose. And, and, and I just hope that the, the thing that comes out of that is, great races and respect for your fellow fellow athletes that are putting the work in and you know I don't think that's been the, the full picture thus far but I think hopefully we're moving towards that. Last thing looking ahead 2024 Olympic year in Paris back in Europe uh, but also before that there's a lot of prep you ran a 63 45 half marathon surprised a lot of people last year yeah. uh, are we going to see you back out there for a half is that that the rumor on the street listen they come out with these hyperion products and i'm like well we've got to we've got to hit the full range so yeah we're going to be running in san diego uh, holiday half on the 16th of december it's going to be pretty low key in terms of like um, the races that I do. I think it's just going to be a nice hard effort at the end of the year. Training's going really well. We're in a really good spot, but again, we don't train for the half, so you never really know what's going to happen. But um, yeah, it's just uh, the beasts across the, um, across the board are going to be running these time trials and hard efforts. So that's, that's my one of like getting out of my comfort zone and doing something difficult. So uh, yeah, we're going to go after it in these Hyperion Elite Fours. So the first shoe to run a 347 mile and uh, who knows, 60, Six, 60 some odd 60 half? Something. It's not going to be a 59 something. So, uh, yeah, I think the yeah, I think uh, versatile across the board from mile up to the half for me. Um, so, yeah, we'll see. Cool, Josh. Thanks so much for being with us, and we wish you all the best this year. Uh, and we're looking forward to Paris 2024. Same. Love it. Thank you.